sit down and clap your hands and give God praise in this place. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Uh, yesterday at the conference, we, there was a gentleman who came here about three or four weeks ago, Sundays ago, and left before I started preaching or something like that. And I met him at a conference yesterday. We were concerned. We thought, ah, is he a spy or something like that? But not at all. He's a friend of, uh, I think, Madeline and Deborah, a young, tall guy. And so he came to me. Yeah, he was sitting here. And he came to me and said, I was in your church. I said, all right, yeah, we're a bit concerned. He said, oh, no, no, I have to go to my church and serve. Amen. So we thank God for that. And I guess he had to leave early because uh, he didn't see you guys as well. <laughs> Amen. But it was good to see him. So worry not. Hallelujah. Amen. We have to keep an eye on everyone. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now today we, we're going to continue uh, our teachings on evangelism. I believe the enemy wants to stop this message, but he cannot. Amen. Satan will always want to stop the things that he knows will propagate the kingdom and will, you know, fulfill God's agenda. He will do everything he, want, he can to stop it, but he cannot. So today we're talking about motivated for mission. Motivated for mission. Amen. Now we know from last week's message that the church was left on earth the printout will be coming soon because the computer was messing up, but it should be coming soon. <clears throat> so we know from last week's message that the church was left on earth to complete the mission of Jesus, which means that Jesus' mission is now our responsibility. Somebody say, it's my responsibility, it's my responsibility. to finish the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus. Again, it is my responsibility to finish the mission of Jesus Christ. The of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that, you know, he gave some to be apostles, he gave some to be prophets and pastors and, you know, uh, teachers, some to be uh, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in that order. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. A, 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 and uh, for the work of the ministry, you know, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So God has given us gifts in the body. But when we say that it is our responsibility to complete the mission of Jesus, we are not saying that everybody should become an apostle, a pastor, uh, an evangelist, a prophet, a teacher. That, that's not what we are saying. God has gifted some people for that office. But when we talk about the body of Christ, and on Wednesdays we are discussing spiritual gifts. And I'm doing this deliberately because when you look at it, we've talked about faith. And we are talking about spiritual gift because you need faith to be able to operate the spirit, your spiritual gift. Amen. Do you understand? The Bible says the Lord has dealt with everyone a measure of faith. And everybody, the moment you are born again, you have at least one spiritual gift which you must discover and use. What do you use it for? To complete the mission of Jesus. The Holy Spirit was given for the purpose of finishing the Great Commission. That is the mission of Jesus. Amen. So this week and next week, we are going to look at how we can finish this mission, how you can share the gospel. More often than not, when we say we must do evangelism, everybody think, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind, correct me if I'm wrong, but the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear evangelism is what? Jehovah Witnesses. Right? Because of the way some of you have dealt with them, you know, you, as soon as they knock on your door, you see them, oh, bang, not interested, bang. So somehow you think, that you have to do it like Jehovah Witnesses. Um, that will become more clarified, hopefully, today and next week. Because you don't have to do it like the Jehovah Witness. Although, the Bible says we should go to them. It does not mean that you should go and knock on everybody's doors. We need to knock on doors. But it doesn't mean that you should do it like the Jehovah Witnesses. Some people... Their, their effective method will be knocking on doors because they have beautiful smile, warm personality, and so they, they can do that. But some people, um, even when they see your face alone, you know, they might call the police. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, and some of you... <laughs> so, so for some of us, be before we go into... <laughs> I hope to help somebody here. Hallelujah. But when you, when you, when you study... 
I, I hope you've, you've looked at fishing before, and you know that there are different ways and different methods of fishing, and it's all fishing. Sometimes they fish with trawlers, you know, like a boat on the sea, and, and they come out and they catch the big, big fish, the tunas and, you know, the barracudas and what have you. And uh, sometimes they fish with nets, and sometimes they fish with hook and line. Sometimes they use traps to catch fish. They use different methods, and it's all fishing. Are you following? So sometimes, some people, we, as a church, we can go fishing with a, a trawler. It's called crusade. All right? Can go with the nets. It's also a crusade style where you have a huge rally and an anointed evangelist comes, he preaches, and hundreds and maybe thousands of people come and give their life to Christ. That's the net and the trawler kind of fishing. And then there is the using the trap and using the uh, hook and line format, all right? Sometimes people even use chemicals, but that's, that's not healthy. <laughs> Amen. And the hook and line, you discover that when you're using hook and line, you need to know the type of bait to use because different fish actually bite different baits. Are you understanding? Tilapia and snapper don't eat the same thing. They are both fish. In fact, they have different environments. Are you following? You don't catch tilapia in the sea. You catch them in rivers and in ponds and so on and so forth. If you want snapper, you get to the sea. And the bait, they, they eat something different. So you need to use a different bait. In the same way, when you think about it in this light, that means different people requires different approach and different strategy. You cannot treat everybody the same. Praise the Lord. Okay? The kind of chemical fishing and toxic fishing is going for evangelism, and you have one style. Jesus is coming soon. You repent or burn, burn in hell. <laughs> all right. Okay, you are poisoning the fish, all right? They will die before you even catch them. We don't do that. So hopefully this week, next week, we are going to be learning and my prayer is that you'll be able to find or identify your style of fishing and you keep it. Because we need all the different methods and the different approach and the different ways to be functioning in this church so we can attract the kinds of people, all right, that we can attract or we are shaped to attract and to evangelize. Do you follow what I'm saying? For, let, let me give you an example. I thought about it this morning. The first few years of JCC, when we started, I clearly defined the sort of people we want to reach. And based on our family, husband, wife, two children, we targeted families with young children. And before long, the church was full of husband, wife, children, husband, wife, children, husband, wife, children. Why? Because once they come to the church, what they see up in front of them it's like them, married man, woman, children. So that's the reason why today our church is, um, there I say, about 90%, maybe more, married. Families. You see what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. All right. So today we are going to look at 10 facts that should motivate all of us to make it our primary goal to complete Jesus' mission. It is our responsibility. And there are 10 facts that should motivate us to make it our primary goal to complete the mission of Jesus on earth. John chapter 17 verse 20, the Bible says, here is Jesus praying and listen to this. Do you know that Jesus prayed for you? John 17, 20, Jesus said, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Say to your neighbor, Jesus prayed for you. Now, last week we dealt with the three hindrances to evangelism or to the mission. Number one is what? Fear. Number two is shame. Feeling ashamed. Number three is what? Busyness. I'm too busy. And we said that 
You know, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my heavenly father. That's a serious uh, um, you know, warning, if we can call it warning. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. So if you are saying, you see people who are suffering and they need Jesus, and you are saying that, well, I'm shy. Well, I'm afraid. Well, uh, I'm too busy. Can't go to evangelism. I'm working. You know, I have to pay the mortgage and stuff like that. Remember, it's a form of, or it's a way of you denying Jesus before men. And what you are doing is that you are invariably setting yourself up for Christ to also deny you before the Father. Something we need to think about. So regardless of your age, so long as you have an understanding and you've got friends and stuff like that, you need to understand. Hopefully next week, I'll tell you about your fish, fish pond. You need to know your you're fishing, you know, the pond in which you must fish in. Praise the Lord. So Jesus has prayed for you 2,000 years ago, and his prayers are still effective today. So 10 facts that motivates me. 10 facts that motivates me. Number one, if we want to be like Jesus, if I want to be like Jesus, my life mission must include his life mission. So the missing word there on your outline is my and his. If I want to be like Jesus, then my life mission must include his life mission. This is not a call for you to abandon what you do. For example, you are a doctor, you are an engineer, you are a mechanic, you are a a lawyer, a teacher, whatever it is, the goal is not for you to abandon that and say, I'm going to serve Jesus, but it is for you to learn how to serve Jesus as who you are, as a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, an engineer, a mechanic, whatever. You understand that? So if I want to be Jesus, then my life mission must include his life mission. So while you are serving as a doctor, be mindful of the fact that you are a Christian doctor and you must represent Christ in that arena. So win souls for Christ. Praise the Lord. Win souls for Christ as a lawyer. Win souls for Christ as a nurse. Number two, Jesus expects me to continue his mission. The missing word on, on your outline there is expect. Jesus expects me to continue his mission. Jesus wants us, to com uh, wants us to complete his mission. It's completing, that's one. His mission so much so that he commanded us five times. Can we look at all the five times he commanded us in scripture? The first one is Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Jesus said, therefore go make disciples of all the... Go make disciples of what? All the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's the promise of his presence and protection whilst we include his mission in our life mission. So Jesus said that go and make disciples of all the nations. It might interest you to know that the Greek word translated nations is the word ethnos from which we get our English word ethnic. So when he says the nations, it's not saying that, for example, you should jump to Nigeria or go to Sierra Leone or go to, um, let's say, Mexico and say I'm a missionary. That is implied, but... The primary meaning of the word ethnos is, is to go to the people groups. Because within every nation, there are different people groups. Even in Baselding, there are different people groups. A few weeks ago, I was in a conference, about three weeks ago, or two Saturdays ago, I was in a conference, and this month is just conference, conference, conference. That's my middle name. <laughs> I was in a conference, and we were looking at... Um, it's called Common Grounds. And we were looking at basically how to do missions in the diaspora. And something caught my eye. It was a poster uh, in one of the rooms at the London City Mission just by Tower Bridge. A and the poster says that there are 300 languages spoken in London. Think about it. 300 
languages spoken in London. What does that mean? Because we know that the, the language of this country is what? The United Kingdom. There are three, three languages. That's what? There's English, Welsh, and Irish. Three. And maybe if you consider Scots. So they have about four. But there are 300 languages spoken in London alone. How many do we have in Basildon, Essex? Some time back, I, I saw in the local newspaper, The Echo, that there's an area, I think it was in Harlow. The road signs in that area was written in Polish in this country because there were so many Polish people living there. So they have to put the road signs in Polish as well. So 300 languages spoken in London means that the world has come to the UK. You don't necessarily have to travel. All you need to do is look around your work colleagues and you know the world is at the doorsteps of the UK. Praise the Lord. And so the ethnic people are here. We need to start reaching them. This was Paul's strategy. He would choose a major cosmopolitan city and he would go and plant the church there with the aim that once he trains the church and teaches them very well, he has actually reached the nations from where the people in the church have come from. That was how he strategized. So the church of Corinth was like that. Praise the Lord. So we must learn to go for the ethnic people. All of them, everybody must hear the gospel. The second command, look at it. You, Mark chapter 16 verse 15. It says, you are to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. That's the um, Mark 16 15 in the Living Bible. Preach it to everyone, everywhere. So this is broken down for everyone. No exception. Everyone, everywhere, we are to preach the gospel to them. And then let's, let's look at another one. Luke 24, verse 47. New Living Translation. Luke 24, 47. With my authority, take this message of repentance to all the nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sin... For all who turn to me, Jesus said. Number four. John 20, 21. In the New International Version, he says, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Somebody say, I'm sent. I'm sent. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. New International Version. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So again, there is something common about all the five great commissions, the five commands. There is something common. Who can tell me what it is? It's almost at the beginning of every, every sentence, and it's there in the verse. Is what? Go. Go. Somebody say go. go. Now, what the church has done is we have tr translated go into come. Okay? So we sit in our buildings on our blessed assurance, nice heating, you know, warm atmosphere, good music, hot coffee and tea with biscuits. And we tell everybody, come to us. We are the church. We've got the answer. And Jesus never said, come. He didn't tell his disciples, sit down and say, come to them. He said, what? Go. He said, go. The church must move. Somebody said, we've got to move. The church must what? Move. We have to be on the move. So keep going. As you are going to work, remember you are going. 
So you can still obey the command of Jesus whilst you're going to work. There are so many souls in your workplace. There are so many souls in your area where you live, your community. There are so many souls on the streets. There are so many souls in the marketplace. There are so many souls in the shopping center. There are so many souls in the bank. Jesus says, go. And there are wonderful promises that comes with this. Hallelujah. So number three, the third thing to motivate us. We talk about the second thing to motivate us and we look at the five great commissions that Christ has given us. That is the second one is Jesus expects me to continue his mission. Okay, that's number two. Jesus expects me. The missing word there is expect. Number three, sharing the good news is my responsibility. Sharing the good news is my responsibility. It is your responsibility to share the good news with those who are without Christ. It says you must warn them so they may leave. If you don't speak out to them, if you don't speak out to warn the wicked to stop their evil ways, they will die in their sins, but I will hold you responsible for their death. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18. In the new century version. This is serious. Somebody you don't know. But you are in contact with who doesn't know Christ. If we don't tell them about Jesus and they die. The, the, the Bible says that you will be held responsible. For their death without Christ. This is serious. Amen. Again, telling the good news, 1 Corinthians 9.16. Telling the good news is my duty, something I must do, the Apostle Paul said. And how terrible it will be for me if I do not tell the good news. And so with this, we need to understand that if I am a Christian, my mission is not optional. If I am a Christian then my mission is not optional. You don't pick and choose. You can pick and choose the people you want to reach out to, but you must reach out to them. You don't say that, I, as for me, I don't know how to evangelize. No. Amen. That's why we are teaching this to help you and to teach you. Number four, sharing the good news is a privilege. Sharing the good news is a privilege. The Bible says that and God has given us the privilege of urging everyone to come into his favor and be reconciled to him. This is the wonderful message he has given us to all to tell others we are Christ's ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.18 in the Living Bible. I am proud of the good news, says Paul in Romans 1 verse 16. Because it is the power God uses to save everyone to believe. Everyone who believes. You see, the good news is the power God uses. It is not your power. It is not your strength. It is not my ability. It is, not, it is, it is God's good news. The gospel itself is powerful enough. So long as it comes out of your mouth, don't worry about what you think might happen or might not happen. Just say the word and leave the Holy Spirit to do his work. Praise the Lord. Leave the Holy Spirit to do his work. I mean, last Sunday or the Sunday before last, a young lady came here who was invited by one of our sisters. And after the service, they came to see me in the office just to say hello. And even during the service, the Lord just showed me something about the lady. And because, again, I don't know her, so I was a bit hesitant. But when she came to the office, we were talking, and I felt the prompting. So I said, can I pray with you? And I held her hands, and we started praying. And just as I was praying, you know, the Holy Spirit was giving me all the words that was just coming into my mind. And I was mentioning them and she started crying. I mean, she was bawling in the office. I don't know her from Adam. Amen. And I'm going to continue to pray for that young lady because I believe God wants to do something in her life. Amen. Listen, you just have to go. And you'll be amazed how the Holy Spirit can use you. But if you don't go, you would not know that you've got it inside you. Hallelujah. Number five, I am grateful. That's the word. I am grateful for what Jesus has done for me. 
Somebody say with me. Let's repeat number five. I am grateful for what Jesus has done for me. The Bible says, Ephesians 2.12, the Bible says that remember that in the past you were without Christ. You had no hope and you did not know God. In the past, you listening to me, you watching me, you had no hope because you didn't know Christ. But now that you know him, you should be grateful for what Jesus has done for you. That is why you must tell everybody about what he has done for you. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in our culture and to people in other cultures. Romans 1 verse 14, New Living Translation. And again, 2 Corinthians 5 14, the Bible says that for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. For Christ's love compels us. Are you compelled by the love of Christ to share the gospel? I read something that was written by, I think it was Rick Warren. And uh, he put the question that either Rick Warren or somebody, I don't know. But he says that is somebody, you know, would somebody go to heaven because of the way you live your life? And that so challenged me. Will somebody go to heaven because of the way you live your life? Because I can guarantee you, sometimes the way we live our lives and the things we do actually becomes a stumbling block to, to people from coming because they don't see the light. They see you, but they see no light. And we must, the, the, the Bible says, let your light what? Shine before men. Be radiant. In other words, don't hide your Christianity, but rather express it in a way that it will people. Because light attracts. Darkness repels. If, if there's a room here right now and it's pitch dark, you won't go in there. But if there's a light in the room, who will you? you will go because there's light there. And if you are light, then people will come to you. And the way to be light is to let the fruit of the Spirit, not the gift of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit, which is patience, gentleness, love, kindness. Galatians 5, 22. Let those things show forth. Praise the Lord. Number six. Why must we be motivated for mission? Because people are hopeless without Christ. People are hopeless without Christ. Hallelujah. Somebody say it with me, people are hopeless, people are hopeless. Without, Christ. without Christ. Have you ever asked somebody, what's your mission in life? What's your goal in life? Have you asked some of your work colleagues, maybe make it a test and ask somebody, what's your goal in life? What's your mission in life? And see what they tell you. What do you think the answer will be? Some of them will say, I don't know. I'm just enjoying life. I take each day as it comes. What they are saying to you is, I'm hopeless. Without Christ, people have no hope at all. We must help them. The Bible says in... Romans chapter 10, verse 13 to 14, New Century Version says, Anyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. But before people can ask the Lord for help, they must believe in Him. And before they can believe in Him, they must hear about Him. And for them to hear about the Lord, someone must tell them. Who is that someone? I know. We all like to leave things for someone to do it. I've been searching for a long time and I still haven't found someone. Anytime I try to find someone, I find me. So what does it mean? Because sometimes I wait for someone to clean this auditorium. And then I look around and I realize that I am the only one here. Who is seeing the mess? And no matter how I pray and shout, someone would not come. Because there's nobody here but me. So someone is you. When you see something going wrong in any part of this building, don't leave it for someone because there's no someone. That someone is you. If you are leaving your neighbors for someone to tell 
time about Jesus, somebody who knows the Bible more, it's that someone is you. Tell your neighbor, I am someone. Remember the very first week I gave you a leaflet from the Billy Graham crusade which says, I am Andrew? Because Andrew is someone. When he met Jesus, he went and looked for his brother. And he said, we have found the Lord. We have found the Messiah. Tell somebody, be a someone. Be a someone. Number seven, because God wants everybody. Why must we be motivated for missions? God wants everybody saved. Did you see that? That means your uncle who is still hooked on palm wine in the village needs to be saved. It means your auntie who is caught up in traditional worship needs Jesus. If grandpa is not saved, my friend, you got to be someone to them because God wants everyone to be saved. Is that in the Bible? Yes. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. The New International Version. The Bible says, God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants who? He wants who? All men. all men. That is all humans to be saved. It is not God's will. Listen to me. It is not God's will that any human being created in his image should go to hell. People will only go to hell by choice. That is, if you tell them about the love of Christ, about the fact that there is forgiveness in Christ, and they refuse, that's their choice. Christ will not require their blood from you because you have done your bits. You understand that? But if you don't do it, then it's not their fault. It's your fault. Imagine the person who told you about Jesus, if they had kept quiet and said, I'm afraid, I'm shy, I'm too busy, I haven't got time to be talking to people right now, I'll talk to you later. Where would you be by now? Answer that question for yourself. Number eight. <laughs> Let me add this to number seven, the second scripture. It's on your sheet, isn't it? You have it on your outline. Let me not worry about it because you can read it later. Please make, make it a point to read it because of time. Number eight. I, we all like this one. But I'm glad it's number eight and not number one. So you have to do all the seven things before you get to the reward. I will be rewarded for eternity. I will be rewarded for eternity. This should motivate you to preach the gospel, to tell somebody about the love of Christ. I will be re because the reward is eternal. Remember that you will receive your reward from the Lord, which he promised to his people. Colossians 3.24. Oh, praise the Lord. Number nine. This is what even makes it more serious. What must motivate us to share the gospel with our loved ones? It says that God's timetable for history hinges around us completing our mission. The Bible says, Matthew 24, 14. The Bible says this. This is why I believe that Jesus Christ hasn't come yet. And I hope I'm not being too presumptuous. I hope I'm not stepping out of order. I hope I'm not being arrogant by saying, and dare I say that I don't think he is coming this year because of what we are about to read. Let's read it. Matthew 24, verse 14. The good news about God's kingdom will be preached in all the world to every nation, that's our word again, ethnic people, people groups, then the end will what? Come. This is one of the surest promises of the scripture. That the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, though we don't know the date and time, the Bible has given us a clue that one of the things that will precede his coming and will in fact trigger the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is when the good news of his kingdom has been preached to all the people groups everywhere in the world, then Christ will come. Why is that? Because Christ's second coming is not for salvation. His second coming is for judgments. And for him to be a fair judge, everybody must at least hear the gospel once. You've got to have been given a chance at least. Then whether you are guilty or not, 
It's up to you. So he says the good news of the kingdom must be preached. He didn't say should be preached. It's a must. It's an imperative. It's something that we have to do. So the coming of Christ, that timetable hinges on the gospel being preached to every soul on earth. Then the Bible says the end will come. The Bible also says in Acts chapter 1 verse 6 to 8, they ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or dates. Uh, uh, by the way, if somebody tells you that, that you know, I am a prophet and I see in the spirit that Jesus is going to come on this particular day, tell them, uh -uh. that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Acts chapter uh, 1 verse 6 to 8, it says it is not for you to know the time. Jesus kept that secret from us. The exact date, time, and day, we don't know. What we know is that he is coming. Somebody say he is coming. And you have to be ready. Because I have a feeling that, you know, as I tend to know my own people very well, if we know the date, for example, if Jesus said he's coming 31st, my goodness, 31st December, you know what people are going to do? They say, ah, this is uh, November 17th, don't worry, more time for fun. And then 29th December, you know, at about 12 midnight, you give your life to Christ. Say, I am born again, Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Now, Jesus, you can come. So he has kept that from you. And, and the Bible says that he will come like a thief in the night. He will come when you least expect it. He will come as a surprise. But the Bible also tells us that those who look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, hallelujah, nothing will surprise us. We will know because we are always looking and we are always searching. And you know that even as I talk some very serious biblical prophecies that is linked to the second coming of Christ is being fulfilled and has been fulfilled. What is yet to happen is for the gospel to get to all people groups everywhere. That's one of the things about certain prophetic uh, you know, words declared in the Bible has already been fulfilled. Praise the Lord. One of the things that the Bible says that, you know, will happen just before Christ comes, the Bible talks about Jerusalem becoming the capital of Israel, and Donald Trump has just done that. People don't understand that. That guy may be doing all the crazy stuff he's doing right now, but I'm telling you something, as strange as he's, he is, God is using that guy. I'm not saying that because of that you should vote for him, but I'm saying that God is using him. As crazy as you think he may be, God is using him to fulfill certain biblical prophecies. And you say, can God do that? Oh, yes. He did it to Cyrus. He said to Cyrus, you don't know me, but I'm going to use you. And he used him to set the Israelites free. He came and he made a decree. He said, all the Israelites must go back, go and build the temple, go and build the wall. He did that. And so, and so it's not strange to me at all. While I don't agree with everything he does, but at least there are certain things that the guy has got the grit and the guts to do. He just came and he said, okay, Israel is the capital of Jerusalem and that's it, I've said it. And people don't agree, some nations are voting against it, but he has said it and he stands. Number 10. Should I give you one more scripture about number 9? It's on your, it's on your outline. Acts chapter 1 verse 9 to 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Hello? How is Jesus coming back? Again? Please never forget that. How is Jesus coming back? How did he, how did he go? Okay. The guy was standing there talking to them. 
And suddenly he was lifted up like a rocket. All right? Slow motion. They were standing there talking, looking at him. Just imagine that. The disciples on the Mount of Olivet. As they were talking, in fact, Matthew and Mark seems to believe that that was the time he gave them the great commission, go into the world and preach the gospel. And while he said this, they said, I am, lo, I am with you to the end of the age. He was lifted up right before them. The man was like being lifted like a rocket, slow motion. So their head, they were like this, and their head was going. And a cloud received them from their side. Then all of a sudden, why are you looking up? Two angels. And the angel confirmed and said, this Jesus that you saw go up like this, he is coming the same way. So when somebody tells you that Jesus has now arrived in America, tell them, I didn't see the sky crack open. Because the Bible said that when the time is ready for him to come, he will come back in the same way. In fact, we are told in Revelation that all eyes will see him. Some people are saying that, oh, they will put TV cameras. Oh, no, no, no. I don't think the TV cameras will do that. Because some of those people handling the cameras, they are not born again. When the sky cracks open, they will split. Man, come and see speed. They'll run away. I believe that God would do it in such a way because he is the creator. He would do it in such a way that when the sky cracks open, everybody everywhere will see him coming. And there will be no time for repentance. Number 10. I will be glad. That's the missing word. I will be glad when I see people in heaven. The Bible says, Luke 15 verse 7, the Bible says that, I tell you, there is much joy in heaven when one sinner changes his heart. Don't you want to be part of that party? It says when one sinner, not many, one. If you want the party to continue in heaven, save one soul. There will be another all night in heaven. Celebration. Woo! One person will say hallelujah. Glory be to God. Knowing this, brothers and sisters, what should be my response? Acts 2024. 20, That's what should be our response. I want to carry out the mission I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. The mission of testifying to the good news of God's kindness. The good news of what? Oh, Hallelujah. Somebody say, I must go. Somebody say, I must tell somebody. Next week, you're going to have a few more papers in your hands next week because I'm going to bring you some diagrams that should help you, you know, how, uh, help you with sharing the gospel. Because most of the time to share the gospel, all you need to do is to tell people your story, how you came to Christ. And sometimes we don't know how to, some of you have got rich testimonies. You see, and the reason why your testimony can build a powerful bridge to allow people to come to Christ is that, number one, you are the authority on your own testimony. You are the authority of your testimony. Nobody can argue with that. Amen. If I tell you how I came to Christ, you would know because I can't, I can't make that up. I just can't make that up. Praise the Lord. Especially when this is being recorded, you know, some of my classmates will see it in Ghana and say, ah, that's not true. We know this boy. Amen. You can't make that up. But, but you will learn how to share your testimony. And it's, it's very easy. And then once you learn to do the four things, pray for them, you share your testimony, you know, you invite them. It's as simple as that. Sometimes some of your friends, all they are waiting for is your invitation. Hey. We, we've got this program in church. You want to come? That's it. I'm going to church uh, tomorrow. Do you want to come? Just ask them. Y you know, my pastor is teaching on um, the importance of witnessing. Do you want to come and listen? My pastor is teaching on marriage. Do you want to come? Let them come. Meanwhile, you've done your praying. You've done your connections and befriending. And then you invite them. And then when they come, don't just leave them. The last thing you do is you follow them up. Amen. Follow them up. So, oh, how did you find our church? When they say, I think your pastor is very interesting. He's very funny. They say, oh, yeah, that's one side. But what do you think about what he said about this? It's very, very, very easy. 
Somebody say it's easy. It's not difficult at all. So don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Listen, if we all win one soul, there's about, uh, let's say, 100, maybe 110 of us here. If all of us win one soul one year, that means every year this church will double. If we do that for 10 years, think of what will happen. Like all of us, we are even more than 100, if we include the youth and, and even the children in Sunday school are even bringing some of their friends. All they have to do is go and tell their children that our Sunday school is fun. In fact, this morning I heard they were playing some music. I almost stayed with them. It's like, wow, Sunday school rocks, man. Hallelujah. Be motivated for mission. Look at these 10 things again. Go through them over and over again. Make it a personal thing as you read through them. And let's be serious about mission. It is, not, it is not about the fact that Saturday we all have to gather here and go. That's also important. But as I said, because some of you have different skills, so what we want to do is empower you and, and talk, you know, show you how you can, you can start your own way. I'm saying. Because, you see, I, I, can, I can never reach a drug addict. Maybe they will listen to me, YouTube, and then somehow they give their life to Christ. Praise the Lord. But, but like to go and minister to them and stuff like that, I'll be out of my pond. Because I've never been to that world before. But, but when I meet like, um, you know, married couples and stuff like that, oh, if I, that's not my pond, that's my swimming pool. And then, and then when I meet people who have been like they've been involved in the army or Boy Scouts and stuff like that, that's my pond because I've been there. Praise the Lord. When I meet people who have been through a certain struggle and stuff, I can easily connect with them because that's my pond. Same applies to you. You have your own fishing pond. We will just show you what your fishing pond looked like and then we'll even show you what kind of fish because we must all not catch tilapia. No, 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 no. Some of you are tuna fishes. In fact, some of you, God has so empowered you to catch whales. You know whale? I mean, when, when, if we catch one whale and we bring them here, hey! one offering <laughs> will make the building shake. No, some people are positioned to do that, to catch a whale. Some people, you are positioned to catch golden fish. There's nothing wrong with that. Just work with yours. We need the whale. We need the tilapia. We need the golden fish. We need all. So that when you step here, people will say, my, my, my. Hallelujah. That church is rich with people. How I pray that one day, you know, in Yongicho's church, when people are looking for the best employees, that's where they go, in South Korea. Because whenever people hire them, they always testify that whenever we got somebody from that church, they work overtime, they don't ask for pay, they show up early, they leave late, they are so dedicated, they are so committed. What a testimony. So every person who wants to break through in their business, go and employ somebody from that church. Do you know what they are doing? Because even people who are not saved, CEOs who are not saved, go to that church to go and employ people. Do you know what they are doing? They are actually inviting people to bring them <laughs> into the kingdom. Eventually, the CEO is going to find Christ because those people will not shut up. They will share the gospel. So these are things we will learn by the grace of God. I want us to rise up and pray right now. Just two minutes. I want you to pray into the word you are